Welcome back to Two Sides. I'm Christy Mazurek. And Joel Jambra. You may have remembered it was a proposal, piece of legislation getting pushed around in the assembly, you know, about changing the parameters of possession of drugs. But there really is a push now nationwide, uh, some calling for the legalization of drugs. And our guest, Peter Chris, is a former police captain. You are in favor of legalizing drugs. And some would be aghast to hear a former cop is actually saying, let's favor the legalization of drugs. Why do you think it should happen? Okay, one thing real quick. I'm a retired police captain, so I spend 20 years and they send me a check every month. So I just <laughs> wanted to point that out. Uh, yes, I'm one of the co-founders of LEAP, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. And why we came together as an organization in 2002 is because we see the failure of the, polit of the policy of prohibition in our society. Uh, I was talking to somebody earlier today and they said, well, you think these gangsters will just become honest people if we legalize drugs? And my answer to them was no, the gangsters will stay gangsters, but most of the people that are involved in this illegal trade, you really wouldn't classify as gangsters. They're more like opportunists. To give you a quick example, uh, in 1919, there was a homicide rate in this country. We instituted alcohol prohibition in 1920. The homicide rate in this country climbed every year until it peaked in 1933 when we legalized alcohol. And by 1937, the homicide rate in America was back down to the level it was at before alcohol prohibition started. And I want to point out one other thing about 1937. That was the deepest, darkest period of the depression in this country. So there was a lot of angry people, but they weren't killing themselves anymore because we took the product away that they were killing themselves over. Legalization of drugs is not about the drugs. It is about the gangsterism and terrorism that is supported by the illegal marketplace in this country. So, I mean, where do you begin? Because some people just out of the gate are going, whoa, they're still trying to wrap their head around that a retired police captain wants drugs, very criminalized, now to be made legal. It just doesn't make sense. <laughs> well, I can understand that, and it's because I think they think the issue is about the drugs. And as I said before, it isn't. It's about the crime and violence. Law enforcement was designed by a guy by the name of Robert Peel over in London, England in the early 1800s. Uh, that's why they call them Bobbies, by the way, Robert Peel. And he designed an organization of law enforcement that would protect people from other people doing them harm. When you institute a prohibition like we have with drugs in this country, what you are doing is not protecting people from other people. You are attempting to use law enforcement to protect people from themselves. Protecting you from yourself is a function of family, church, education, and the health care system. It never is and never should have been intended to be a law enforcement function. We are out there enforcing morality when we enforce drug laws, and that is not our job. We were not trained to do it. We are not capable of doing it. And if anything else, you see the failure of it. We've been doing this for over 40 years since Nixon kicked it off, and the drugs are more available, purer quality, and cheaper than they've ever been before on the streets of America. And we've had 40,000 deaths in Mexico in the last five years fighting over this drug trade. Plus, we've destroyed more lives than, drug have, than the drugs have by incarcerating people and hanging felony convictions on them and denying them college educations, denying them jobs for no good reason. And one other thing I want to point out, just in case people think that if we do it hard enough, this is actually going to be doable to make drugs go away. We have the largest prison system on the planet. And I would like to point out one of the most efficient prison systems on the planet. And in that huge, efficient prison system, we do not have one drug-free prison in America. And if you cannot keep drugs out of prison, who is going to be delusional enough to think you can keep them out of a free society? Or a high school, for that matter. Or a high school. Peter, <laughs> th this is another classic um, argument uh, that, that's very much like Einstein's theory of insanity. You know, you can think you can do things the same way and get a different result. Uh, I think President Nixon declared war on drugs over 30 years ago. How are we doing on that war? Well, we're losing. In fact, I, I speak to a lot of Rotary Clubs, Kiwatas Clubs, Lions Clubs, and I start out my presentation by asking them a question. And the question is, do you think we can win the war on drugs? Now, 
Let's define what winning war means. We won the Second World War. We don't fight the Germans and the Italians and the Japanese every once in a while. The war is over. We won it. It's done. Okay? That's what one war was. So if we win the war on drugs, that means we've taken the word marijuana and heroin out of the dictionary because we've defeated the drugs. They're gone. And I ask people to raise their hands, and nobody ever puts their hand up to think that's possible. So now let's change the discussion. If instead of talking about things like drug-free and winning the war on drugs, we start saying things like drugs are always going to be in our society, they're always going to be here, which group of people do you want to run the marketplace? Do you want it run by gangsters, thugs, and terrorists who have 13-year-old children selling drugs on street corners? Or do you think that maybe a licensed, regulated marketplace where we can set age limits and distribution points and control purity of drugs is a better system? Call me crazy, but I'm not a prohibitionist. I think that a better system is a regulated and controlled marketplace. And don't misunderstand me. I am not implying that if we legalize drugs, that is going to solve our alcohol problem. Just like when we legalized alcohol in 1933, that didn't solve our alcohol problem, mm -hmm. all right? This isn't going to solve our drug problem. We have to deal with our drug problem as an educational and a health care issue. So as well, long as... Well, uh, wait, my question would be then, you know, some would say, I'm sure some of the people at the Rotary Clubs, by the way, I would like to go to the next time that you speak to them because I would love to see their faces when you start your opening pitch. If you're legalizing drugs, doesn't that promote more usage? Gee, I don't know, does it? How many people do you think in America are not using cocaine because they can't get it? Oh, I, I, all right. Every it's single person that wants to get it is going to get it. Acquiring about, the drug is not what makes people decide to use it. It's all, all right? about demand and supply, right, Peter? As long as there's a demand, there's going to be a supply. That's just the entrepreneurial spirit of capitalism, I suspect. So we're saying we're going to take this down to its most minute point and say, just like a pack of cigarettes, if you choose not to smoke, you're not going to do heroin. You're not going to do cocaine. Well, if heroin was legalized, would you go out tomorrow and do heroin? No. Of course not. Of course not. Because I don't know what the effects are. Of That's course not. If That's you exactly. wanted heroin, you can get it today just about anywhere For sure. in the city. Well, that, well it's interesting when you mention right tobacco. Now. It's interesting when you mention tobacco, because one of the comments I get from people all the time is, if we legalize drugs, what kind of a message does that send to our children? It's condoning. It's saying that drugs are really OK. Well, I like to use tobacco. And I, if you ask any tobacco smoker who's been smoking more than 20 years, if they ever felt condoned in this society, they'll tell you, oh, yeah, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I felt absolutely condoned. Every place I walked into, there was an ashtray. I could smoke at an aeroplane all the way from New York to Los Angeles. You ask cigarette smokers today if they feel condoned. And they'll tell you no. They feel barely tolerated by the rest of society. And let's also point out another victory. We have gotten 50% of the adult cigarette smokers to quit smoking in the last 10 years. Without banning one cigarette, without burning or poisoning one tobacco field, just by simply making it less easy for people to smoke, and also by talking against it and pointing out the errors of it. That's the things that work. You know, the drug czar said the other day at a press conference, and I wish if you're ever at this press conference, because you people are in the news, you would ask the question that I always want to ask. He said that this drug issue in America is fundamentally a health care and an educational problem. And nobody asked him, what other health care and educational problems do you think we should use the criminal justice system as our main approach to? Hmm. Because Peter, I can't think of any. Peter, we're going to take a quick break. Stay right there. It is a group called LEAP, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. Peter Christ is here, uh, and we've been talking about how alcohol prohibition uh, led to homicide rates increasing. So you say do away with all the laws and rules and regulations. Again, you can drink alcohol out in public. I don't know if I would want to see someone shooting up, you know, some heroin next to me somewhere. I don't That's where I'm thinking, you know what I'm saying? How do you combat that? I don't well, think that would happen, but I think this is a multi-billion dollar oh, illegal industry oh, sure. that's taking place right now here in America. But how do you combat those? I mean, because th those would be the issues to face. Well, you, you set regulations. We are setting different regulations than we have ever had in this country for tobacco use. We are now preventing people from smoking in the park, in some places, from smoking on the street. We don't allow people to walk down Main Street and, uh, unless they change the laws since I retired, but it used to be illegal to walk down drinking a can of beer. You couldn't do that. So those are things we have to do. You know, I just want to remind you, in 1933, when we legalized alcohol, 
The federal government didn't legalize alcohol and set up a whole regulatory system for the country for alcohol. They basically got out of the prohibition business and said to the states, regulate it any way you want to. Uh, Mississippi didn't end their alcohol prohibition until around 1970, okay? They still, it was still prohibited. You still have dry counties in you some area. It. Those are local things to do. What we're trying to do is get the federal government out of the prohibition business and let the law enforcement go back to doing what they're supposed to be doing, and that's protecting people from each other. You know, 20 years of police work, working in the town of Tonawana, community of about 80,000 people, I remember two incidents. One was a father who found out that his son had committed a rape, and he turned his son into the police for that rape. Another one was a mother who found out that her son was committing burglaries, and she turned her son in for committing burglaries. Not once in 20 years did a parent ever turn their child in for drugs. Not once. And I can't believe that out of 80,000 people, some mother or father didn't find in the sock drawer a little baggie with something in it. But when it was their child, the last thought in the world was to turn this over to the police. They found other ways to deal with that problem. And we as a society should find other ways. We have a five, 450,000 deaths a year. It used to be, it's probably down a little bit due to tobacco. 150,000 deaths a year due to alcohol. Now, my question is, when you look at the, all the illegal drugs and you only have 30,000 deaths a year from all illegal drugs combined, the question is, if prohibition is such a good idea, why don't we bring back alcohol prohibition and prohibit tobacco? If it's a good idea, let's do it with all the things we don't like. And the reality is, when I say that to people, they look at me and say, well, that doesn't work. And that's absolutely right. Prohibition doesn't work. Lydia has a question for you. Mr. Chris, we've gotten a lot of feedback in from a lot I of viewers. I am sure we have. I can't imagine watching what you have to say and not and people not writing in about it. Uh, Bud wrote in, there are places in Asia that have no drugs. They execute people who sell, use, or manufacture drugs. Extreme, but effective. Um, we have one more comment. Well, we have several comments, but this one I'm going to read. Um, just from the legalization and taxation of marijuana in the smoking form only, not paper, clothing, fuels, etc. The profit after savings from anti-marijuana propaganda, courts and prosecution, as well as regulation in the U.S. as a whole would profit in upwards of $42 million annually. Can you speak to that? Well, absolutely. That's what we're talking about. We, we are spending $70 billion a year in this country trying to win this drug war. We could revert that to using that in our prison systems, in the treatment community. We can spend that money other ways. Plus, if we legalize it, I'm sure we're going to tax it. I'm, how, in America, we're not going to tax it? Of course we're going to tax it. We're going to generate income from it. Plus, we'll create jobs. Plus, we'll bring the hemp industry back, which was also outlawed in the 1930s when they outlawed marijuana. And the hemp industry is a very strong industry. And when you mention other countries, I had a guy come up to me after a rotary meeting a couple years ago and he said to me, well, you know what they do in Saudi Arabia if they catch you with drugs? And I said, yeah, and they take you down to the town square and they chop your head off. And he said smugly, yeah, that's right. And I answered him with two answers. One was, Call me crazy, but when I think of countries I want America to be more like, uh, Saudi Arabia is not one of the first ones that pops into my head. <laughs> and two, you know what they do every year in Saudi Arabia when they catch people with drugs? They take them down to the town square and they chop their head off. And you know why they do it every year? Because it doesn't work. If it worked, the rest of the people see that head rolling through the courtyard, that'd be the end of the drug problem. But even that doesn't work. People choose to do this. The first attempt at prohibition that we have any historical record of started with these words. Do not eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Whoa. <laughs> It was we're, in the garden, it was in the garden now, of Eden, and the, reason why it didn't, time. and the reason why it didn't work is told you in Genesis, and it's because the Creator, after creating the two people, granted them free will, Lydia, and that's what we're trying to outlaw. Lydia has one more quick question before we go to the break. I didn't call on that one, but that's okay. Pete wrote in, he said, how much tax revenue would this actually generate if it was legalized? People would grow their own. Presumably, employers would still be permitted to drug test employees, cutting down job opportunities for those who take advantage of this. The police would need to acquire equipment to, to determine if drivers were under the influence of pot when pulled over. There is also the issue of secondhand smoke. It can make those around you high. Can you speak to that quickly? We don't have much time. 
Well, there's a bunch of stuff there, but obviously we have we have driving while intoxicated by drug laws now, so that's not a problem. We have the secondhand smoke thing. We're dealing with that with tobacco by regulating where people can use it and so on and so forth. So that's not the problem. What was the first one you said on there? Uh, if it was legalized, people could uh, grow their own, and employers would still. That's have to right. Drug and I know that everybody listening to me today, after they get done watching this show, will go outside and tend their tomato garden, right? You can grow your own tomatoes. You don't have to buy them from anybody, but you know what? The vast majority of us don't want to do that, so we'd much rather buy them at the store. Let's be honest about this. You can make your own alcohol, too. Very few people do it. That is not the situation. This will create an, uh, an economy. It will get law enforcement out of this work and let us focus on pedophiles, people that are robbing from people, people that are harming other people, instead of going after people that are doing what they choose to do. Peter Chris, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. Wow. Thanks so much for coming on Two Sides. We will definitely have you back, that's for sure. Absolutely.